Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at a couple of Boer War rifles here, or a rifle and a carbine. Uh, and specifically we're talking about the second Anglo-Boer War, which ran from 1899 until 1902. And this was a conflict between the originally Dutch in, in origin Boer settlers and farmers, uh, and the British government. So there was a first Anglo-Boer War in the early 1880s, which kind of ended when the Boers inflicted a couple of pretty substantial uh, military defeats on the British, and then the British just realized that what are we what are we doing here? This is this is a bunch of empty farmland, and it's just not worth it. And there's more important stuff, and they pretty much just like left. Um, however, the situation had changed by the late 1890s, primarily because gold was discovered in the Boer Republics. Um, there were two of these. There were the Orange Free State, the OVS, and the Zuid Afrikaansche Republic, the uh, ZAR, or the South African Republic. Uh, both, uh, you could say, both formed by the same original batch of colonists, but they were separate countries with separate governments, and they acted independently. They just went to war with the British at basically the same time. What happened when gold was discovered, the British all of a sudden got a, a much a renewed interest in controlling these areas, and they worked politically to try and take over control of these two Boer republics. And the way this happened was basically through a, a gold rush, a land rush, that saw a tremendous immigration of miners and workers into these areas that had traditionally been just rural open farmland. And this vastly increased the population of these uh, countries. However, the Boers uh, limited citizenship to basically the original Boer farmers. Uh, this became a, a sticking point when these miners and workers who had come into the area started deciding that, well, maybe they wanted to be citizens, maybe they wanted to have voting rights, they wanted some say in how the government and the laws actually worked in these countries. And the Boers basically looked at them and said, Fitch, no way. You, you know." You just came in here to, to make some money and, and mine the gold. Uh, you don't have any ties to the land. You don't have any right to be a citizen. And this was the, the leverage that the British were able to use to create the conflict that became the Anglo-Boer War, uh, with the goal, in the British mind, being control of these fantastic mineral wealth, mi mineral wealth deposits. So um, things started to come to a head in right at New Year's of 1895 and 96 with what is called the Jameson Raid. And the, idea, the original idea was to have a general strike or revolt uh, by miners in Johannesburg, supported by an invasion, of a, a, a raid of troops coming in from the Rhodesian colony, uh, led by a guy named Jameson. The idea is these two forces would meet up and stuff would happen and then the British would end up in power. Well, the problem is the Boers found out about it and intercepted the raiding party and basically destroyed it, captured all of its guns, threw all those guys in jail, and shut down the whole process. And while we're not going to try and get into all the politics and the, the origins of the Boer War here, what this did is it really uh, alerted the Boers that the British are serious about this and they're up to shenanigans and there's a really good chance that war is going to be coming. So if we transition here a little bit and look at what was the military force of these two Boer republics, it was basically militias, um, referred to as commandos, spelled with a K. So when I use the word commando here, we're talking about like a territorial militia force, not as you might think of it today, special operations, you know, Rambo guys. At any rate, um, in order to be a citizen of either of these Boer republics, you had to you had to be able to provide a horse, a rifle, ammunition, and a couple of weeks' food on basically on demand. Uh, if you were called up to serve militarily, you had to show up with all the basic supplies to do this. Um, these republics were not wealthy, they were agricultural, uh, and they were basically out there to live the way that they saw fit, not to build big cities, not to, well, not to mine gold, to farm and, and live the lifestyle that they wanted. And these the governments of these countries really they couldn't afford the, the large modern, you know, well-equipped modern standing armies like, say, the British Empire had. So instead they relied on a, a universal militia system. Now this is fine, this saves the government a lot of money. Uh, the Boers tend to be very good shots. They're all out hunting all the time just for general, you know, to sustain themselves, to have meat. Uh, and, and they're good shots. The problem is 
because they're not being armed by the central government, there is a huge variety of arms. And should there be a military need for anything more sustained than, you know, repulsing the occasional maybe Zulu raid, although the Boers pretty much lived in peace with the Zulu, uh, should there be any sustained military conflict, they're going to have massive logistical problems. So going into this war, the, the Boer armaments included pretty much everything that was out there. Snyders, Martinis, Vetterlies, uh, maybe a few early Mausers, but probably not. Um, what, are, what were called Mayuba Mausers, uh, British number two muskets. Just anything that a traveling you know, ocean crossing salesmen might bring with him and convince guys to buy everything and, and the, an equally wide variety of ammunition. So as war became, started to look more likely, the Boer governments realized that they needed to try and at least sort of standardize on guns or at least modernize some of the guns. You know, there are a lot of these farmer settlers out there who have old obsolete weapons that are just fine for their hunting needs, but they're not really suited for modern warfare. So there were a couple things that they tried. The three main rifles that were that came out of the, the Boer attempts to arm the country were uh, Craig Jorgensen's, and they only bought a small number of those, like a couple hundred of them for trials. There, there's a famous picture of Tobias Smuts with one that's cool. They're excellent guns. They didn't end up buying them in large numbers. Uh, probably the most numerous one was the Portuguese Guedes, which we have here. Uh, the, the main Boer general, Joubert, loved the Martini, and when he ended up in Europe looking for guns, he came across these at Steyr, and uh, thought, well, hey, that's, that's just the thing. It's a Martini-style action, um, made originally for Portugal, but Portugal didn't take the whole order, so they got these things cheap, and they got tens of thousands of them. The problem was, it's, you know, it's still a single-shot rifle. The better rifle that they came up with was the Mauser. And the Boers would end up with an absolute love affair with the Mauser. The, like the, the national slogan ended up being, uh, by God and Mauser. Met hot and die Moser, with God and the Mauser. Uh, and this originated, it, it actually took some time to convince, you know, with guys like Joubert in charge, wanting Martini-style guns, it took a bit of, of work and delay to get Mausers accepted. But ultimately they were. And there were a couple major orders of Mausers from both the Orange Free State and uh, the ZAR. Now, I do want to point out, um, the ZAR is often called the Transvaal. The Transvaal is the area between the Vaal and Limpopo rivers. That It's a geographically defined area. After the Boer War, this area was incorporated into uh, the British South African colony as the, the province of the Transvaal. Uh, but during the war, it was called the ZAR, the, the South African Republic. At any rate, both of these countries would buy basically identical Mausers that differ really only in markings. And what we're looking at today are Mausers from the ZAR. So there were three major orders of them. The major one was placed in June of 1896, and that was for 20,000 rifles and 5,000 carbines. The carbines were meant probably for artillery troops, although it's not entirely clear if they were actually all issued to artillery troops. Um, and the rifles were for everybody else. Um, the rifles were serialized in two blocks, uh, an A prefix block and a B prefix block with 10,000 guns in each. The carbines uh, were just, just had plain serial numbers with no prefix. These were delivered, they were very well liked, and um, ordered a ton of ammunition with them. And what the republics did was not really issue these so much as offer them for sale at cost to citizens of the ZAR. Of course, as a citizen, you're required to have a rifle, and you know this was a every man had a rifle. It was just a thing, so you could buy a, a nice modern rifle to to upgrade whatever it is that you provided on your own. If you couldn't afford to buy one and didn't have some other rifle, or if you had some other rifle that was unsuitable for combat, uh, the ZAR government actually loaned you one of their new Mausers. So they distributed these things amongst all of the citizenry. Uh, they decided to increase the order, and in April of 97 they placed a second order for another 2,000 rifles, and then in June of 1897 they placed a third following order for another 8,000 rifles and another 2,000 carbines. So in total they ended up uh, purchasing 30,000 rifles and 7,000 carbines, and that doesn't maybe sound like a lot by today's military standards, but the total fighting population strength of 
the ZAR was like 28,000 guys. So this was plenty of rifles to go around. Um, they actually decided that they wanted more, and they attempted to make another order uh, in the summer, two orders actually, in the summer of 1899 uh, for another 4,000 rifles. Those were actually shipped, but by the time they arrived, the, Briti the war had already begun. The British were blockading the ZAR, and so they were unable to take delivery of those rifles. We'll touch on those a little bit more in just a moment. At this point, let's finally actually take a closer look at these two. There is at least one very distinctive feature of these that I want to show you, as well as the way that they're marked. Here is our rifle with its straight bolt handle. This is basically an 1893 pattern Mauser, technically. Um, although the Boers received Mausers that were marked, model 1894, 1895, and 1896. This one's 96, which we'll see in a moment. The one distinctive element about them in particular is on the bolt, and that is this squared off flat surface on the bottom of the bolt. You won't find that on Spanish or Chilean Mausers. You find it exclusively on the Boer Mausers. I think it's also interesting to note that uh, the followers on these are angled down so that they don't lock open on an empty cartridge. Um, there's, there's some Mausers that were, and there are some that have a flat, flat rear to the follower that locks the bolt open uh, when the magazine is empty. The receiver markings on these are also written in German, um, unlike some of the other contracts which were written in perhaps Spanish, um, and it has MOD, model, Mauser, in this case 1896, and then the address Ludwig Löwe and Company, Berlin. Now in late 1896, Ludwig Löwe uh, became DWM, Deutsches Waffen und Munitionfabriken, or Fabrik. Uh, and so this is an interesting way to date some of these guns, is if they're pre-1896 or earlier, they're going to be Löwe, and if they're maybe 1896, basically 1897 or later, are DWM guns. So um, we have that. Interestingly, here, this, uh, the, the Boers didn't necessarily recognize that this was an abbreviation for model, or didn't care. And these rifles were often referred to as the Moldmauser, or uh, later it got actually kind of corrupted into Moltmauser. Um, so you'll often, or you would at the time, hear these guys referring to uh, Boer War era rifles as Moltmausers. The serial number is going to be printed as you would expect on the bolt, and then also on the receiver and in the stock. Uh, the stock number is certainly very easy to uh, to lose over time because it's a lighter stamping. Um, this is a B prefix gun, so this is one of the, the second, well, the first major order, but it's in the second batch of 10,000 that were made. Um, there's an additional number here. Honestly, I'm not sure what that is. It's not standard to bore guns. It's That's something unique to this particular rifle. This stock is actually really well preserved. It still has the stock cartouche, and this is a Leuve cartouche. Uh, there will be a different one for DWM. The guns were all chambered for the 7x57 Mauser cartridge, which is, by the way, an absolutely fantastic cartridge, one of the best, uh, best bolt-action rifle cartridges like this that was ever developed. And the, the rifle rear sight here goes up to 2,000 meters. Front sights were not hooded. They were equipped with cleaning rods and bayonet lugs, which is why the muzzle is stepped right here. However, the Boers didn't really use bayonets. Um, the Boers didn't really let you get close enough for a bayonet to be relevant. One other interesting, unique feature to the Boer Mausers is they were very often um, embellished by the guys who owned them. Remember, this isn't really a military issue gun in the sense of a modern military where they give it to you and you use it, but it remains government property and you give it back to them when you're done with it. This was a very personal rifle. This was your rifle owned by you. Uh, and so a lot of the guys would embellish them with names or battle histories or decorations or all sorts of things. This particular one, I'm pretty sure this is the guy's name, his initials F-A-J, and then Combrank. This is a little, this is a, a common Dutch surname, although its spelling is a little bit odd. It's usually spelled with an I. But this sort of thing is very common to find on Boer Mausers. Substantially more scarce than the rifles are the carbines. There were a total of 7,000 of these. They were ordered in two batches but they were done in one continuous serial number range from 1 to 7,000 uh, without any prefix or suffix on the serial number. Um, they are again a pretty standard Mauser pattern um, artillery carbine, so you've got a shorter front sight, shorter barrel of course, and these did all have bent bolt handles. The rear sight is calibrated out to 1400 meters. 
they were still equipped with bayonet lugs, um, and they still didn't use them on these guns. Uh, the cleaning rod here is also numbered. These cleaning rods are virtually never matching to the guns, even if the gun is matching. And the reason for that is these were actually, uh, these and the rifles both, were made with half-length cleaning rods. So you and your buddy would both have to work together, uh, you know, join two cleaning rod sections together to clean the guns, and then, predictably, nobody ever really paid attention to what the number was. You just took one cleaning rod back when you were done. As a result, they've gotten mixed uh, over and over and over throughout the rifle's uh, service life. As is typical on Mauser carbines, uh, you've got this uh, two very heavy wings on either side of the front sight. Um, I believe that is most often done because when these are used in a cavalry roll, they are dropped into scabbards, and you want something to protect the front sight from that sort of uh, potential abuse. Now this particular rifle is a one of the very late last ones, uh, you know, serial number almost 6700 out of 7000, and you'll notice that the receiver marking is DWM. So this is after 1897 or later, uh, after the company had become DWM. You can also take note of the stock cartouche here, which is different than the Lurva uh, cartouche. This is the DWM cartouche. And we have another little bit of embellishment here on the carbine. Probably just the guy's last initial. These were equipped with sling rings here, both the, the swivel itself and then also the ring for a, basically a single point sling. And they originally came from the factory in this configuration with the, the sling assembly on the left side of the stock. However, they are completely reversible. You can take the two screws out and swap the plate and the sling swivel, and because this position is kind of obnoxious if you're right-handed, this is going to interfere with your cheek weld, most of the guys who got these swapped the slings, the swivels, uh, over onto the right side of the gun. If you did opt to swap the sling ring around, you could also swap this thing. Just flip it around. It is symmetrical, so you can move the sling swivel, the front sling swivel, to the other side. One last thing I want to point out about these is the top of the receiver. Typically with a Mauser, we look here to find information about the gun's origin and identification. And the, the ZAR had no crest on their rifles. In fact, they had they don't say ZAR anywhere on them, on these. They just have uh, the serial numbers. Uh, by the way, the serial number is also in the stock here. This one's almost completely worn away. There is a little cartouche in front of the serial number. You'll also find it on the bolt stub, and we saw it on the stock. That's just a, a DWM cartouche. That's not specific to uh, the ZAR. So there, there's no other identifying mark on here, which can make these uh, kind of a hidden treasure for people who know what they are. For those of you who are wondering, the action on these is a cock on close. Mauser did make both cock on open and cock on close designs. So this is a small ring cock on closing style. Now the third and last of these that I want to show you is this one. And this is a long rifle. You can see the long sight here, and it's a full-length barrel. However, it has the bent bolt handle, and the, uh, the, the, ZAR the ZAR Mausers that were received all had straight bolt handles. This is matching, though, and that bent bolt is original. If we look at the receiver, it's a DWM gun, which means it's late, and it has a serial number of C610. Well, that final 4,000 rifle order uh, what would have been the C, uh, suff or C prefix batch uh, to build upon the A's and the B's that had been originally purchased. Um, these rifles were basically uh, turned back by the British blockade during the, the early year, the first year of the war, and there's, it, it's not entirely clear what happened to them, but what seems most likely is the Boers basically said, uh, drop them off up north where the British aren't blockading, the rifle, and, and we'll send a wagon to come get them. So apparently these were offloaded at Port Said and Dar es Salaam, uh, basically up in Tanzania. The, the cargo ships that were carrying them just continued north up towards um, Suez. And, well, for example, this particular rifle is in South Africa, but it's not clear exactly when they came to South Africa. We don't know if the Boers were able to send transport to go get them while the war was still going on, uh, or if they simply percolated down south during the following years. Ultimately, we don't really even know how many, if any, of these did, in fact, see service during the Boer War. Uh, they would have been very happy to get them, but we don't know if they were able to.
With the end of the Boer War, a lot of these guns were actually destroyed. Um, when the Boers surrendered and handed in their guns, the British didn't uh, stockpile them, they didn't give them to the government, they just flat out destroyed them. So there are not very many surviving, and they are really cool historical relics of, uh, well, here in South Africa it's a very well-remembered conflict. Uh, for much of the rest of the world it's one of those kind of forgotten wars, but it's a really fantastic example of a civilian farming rural militia actually taking on a, well, the major imperial power of the time. And while they didn't win, uh, they gave it a very good go um, and had some pretty spectacular successes. So very cool to get a chance to take a look at these. Um, at some point here we will also be taking a look at uh, Mausers and other, well, other rifles of the Boer War, but in particular Mausers from the Orange Free State. So that'll be a separate video. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you did, stay tuned for more Forgotten Weapons tomorrow, and thank you for watching.